You know, Advent's a, a strange time of the year. We have a hard time separating Advent from Christmas because so often people are looking to the Advent season as we prepare for Christmas for that, you know, all those feel-good messages that, that we expect at Christmas, those little messages about the baby Jesus in the manger, or as Ricky Bobby said, we, in our house we pray the little baby Jesus. But Christmas is that time that makes us all feel good because it's so pastoral, it's so romantic, and we we look for all the greenery, the red bows, all the things that tie up these days together as we move towards the 25th. And of course, in most of our houses, we throw a little ting ting and tinsel in there too. <laughs> But unfortunately, the season of Advent isn't really about celebrating the birth of our Savior. It's about reflection on who our Savior is in our lives and why He came for us and how that relationship that we celebrate with Him is all about. It's a time of not thinking about a stable and a baby and sheep and shepherds, but it's about preparing our lives to celebrate receiving the Savior of the world into our hearts. And the lectionary scriptures teach us during Advent to listen to the prophets from the Old Testament and to look at the stories of the adult Jesus, not the baby Jesus, but the adult Jesus and his interaction with the people that were surrounding him and the people he was ministering to. And so often it's a struggle in these scriptures that we're presented with as a pastor to find sermons that really reflect hope and peace and joy and love without really delving deeply. And your pastor this morning, like many of the prophets of the Old Testament and those that have come before us, are called to use these difficult passages to share what I call a word out of place. It's often difficult, especially knowing the challenges that face each of us in this world today, not to mention what all is happening around us, but you know, our personal things, the, the hurts, the pains, the joys, the, all, the, all of our personal stuff, and then when you put that aside, you just look at what's going on out in the world. It's so hard for us to find a meaningful message about joy or hope or peace. But I also know that in the midst of everything that's happening in each of our lives, no matter what it is, no matter what it is, I'm called to stand before you and bring you a message of hope. I'm called to bring you a message of God's peace and understanding. And I've been given a message today about the joy of the Lord. But I also know that we long for that too. We didn't come here just to hug and kiss and eat some chili today. We came here because we wanted to hear that word out of place. Because everyone in this room is walking down a different path. None of us are walking the same journey. We are each faced with different things in our lives. You can tell that just from listening to the prayer request in here. Everybody's coming from different places and needs different things. And so, how do you take a piece of scripture and look out at this crowd with everybody coming, some from a place of joy, some from a place of sorrow, some from a place of loss, and say, here's the joy of the Lord. The only way to do it is to listen to that word out of place. The passage I'm reading from this morning is from Isaiah. It's the 35th chapter of Isaiah. And if you want to follow along, go we'll look at the first 10 verses of Isaiah 35. But this is a, an introduction. Isaiah was writing to a group of people who had seen their brothers and sisters in the north be totally run over and destroyed by the Assyrians. They were, had been dispersed throughout the northern part of Palestine. There was no longer a northern kingdom. There was only a southern kingdom. And it was an incredible decline. Typically, Jerusalem had been destroyed. 
So their, their entire symbol of who God was in their lives was gone. Their king in the southern kingdom was blinded, powerless, and they were all just standing around waiting on the impending doom of the Babylonians to move in and take over. I know many of y'all are not old enough to remember the 60s, but we had a little thing called the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I don't know how many of you were in school, I was in elementary school, but during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we were taught how to, when the siren went off, to crawl under our desks. Like that's going to stop a big deal from the atomic bomb, but I don't know why we did it. That's what we were told to do. Because we lived a sense of fear of impending doom. You know, it's the whole nuclear age just made us think about impending doom. And it was just no way to find any good thing out of that. There was no joy out of that. I'm glad we have learned to live in this world without that fear now, but still be recognized that it exists. So in our lives today, I think we can find a parallel with the feelings that the Israelites had. All we have to do is read a newspaper, watch the news, see what the latest crimes are, look at the gridlock in Washington, wonder when the next mass shooting or school shooting is going to happen, to realize that we have a lot of problems in this world. And in the midst of all that, how do we find joy? we find joy? Add to that our personal struggles with waiting on a test result to come back from the doctor or mourning the loss of a loved one or wondering if the right job is going to come along or if the housing that we need is going to be there or whatever is happening is going to be the right thing. So I just uh, want to read to you from Isaiah and ask that you listen to the words that he spoke to his people. And he spoke them as a word out of place to them. And so I'd like to do the same for all of us here this morning. And I invite you now to hear the words of Isaiah from the 35th chapter. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation today. Isaiah writes, Even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. The deserts will become as green as the mountains of Lebanon, as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. There the Lord will display his glory, the splendor of our God. With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong and do not fear, for your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. And when He comes, He will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams will water the wasteland. The parched ground will become a pool, and springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where the desert jackals once lived, and a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the Highway of Holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. It will only be for those who walk in God's ways, for fools will never walk there. Lions will not lurk along its course, nor any other ferocious beast. There will be no other dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return, and they will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. This ends the reading of our Old Testament prophet Isaiah this morning. This is the word of God, and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. As I told you a couple of weeks ago, happiness is fleeting, but joy is eternal. That's because the kingdom of God is characterized by joy, not happiness. It's this joy that sustains us in a world where things are just not right. We lit a candle this morning, that pink candle over there. We lit that candle of joy 
not happiness. We did not light a candle of happiness this morning. We lit a candle of joy. And so I want us to think about the difference between happiness and joy this morning a little, but also the impact of joy in our lives and on our souls. There's a popular carol that reminds us that even though the world may not know about or embrace the fact that our Lord has already come, those of us who truly believe know by faith and by our heart that God's kingdom came to each and every one of us through the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. What we humans sometimes forget about, though, is that there is a powerful force, a powerful spiritual force in this world called the wilderness. We have a hard time as Christians reconciling how the kingdom of God can coexist in the same world with the wilderness. We sometimes think that because of our culture and the destructive illusions that pain brings to us and perhaps things we were taught as we grew up and the personal trials we've gone through, that pain is to be avoided at all costs. Got to be happy. Got to be happy. Don't want to pay. We think it's a uh, and our prayers aren't answered, and we're experiencing that downtime, that pain, that, that sense of loss, we think that that's somehow a divine snub against us, but it's not. We've been ingrained with the thought that a blessed and full life should be unscarred by heartbreak and untouched by wilderness. And while all the prosperity gospel preachers out there, they just enforce that week after week. Those feelings are even before the prosperity preachers are nothing new. They've been around from time eternal. Ever since Adam and Eve left out of the Garden of Eden, there has been wilderness, there has been pain, there has been sorrow. And it comes with a purpose. Just look at Moses and the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. They thought they were going to walk out of Egypt and walk right into the promised land. They were going right to that land flowing with milk and honey. But because of their actions, that wasn't the plan that happened. They spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness on their way to that land of milk and honey. You remember in the New Testament, John the Baptist came out of the wilderness in his furry clothes where he had been eating locust and honey and he was bare grills back in the day. <laughs> and so he comes out of the wilderness and he goes down to the Jordan River and he calls these people around to him. And he starts baptizing them with water and off in the distance his cousin Jesus steps down and he walks into it and John <coughs> says, I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals. What do you mean you want me to baptize you? But he did. A voice in the wilderness baptizes Jesus, and immediately as he comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights. And what does he do for those 40 days and nights? First of all, he's, on, he's fasting. He's in a weakened state. And he also does battle with Satan in the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights. Instead of asking ourselves, why would God let this happen to me? Perhaps instead we should ask, what's the lesson I'm to learn as I go through the wilderness? Whether it's 40 years looking for milk and honey, or whether it's 40 days and nights doing battle with Satan. When we're in the wilderness, instead of just automatically assuming that God has deserted us, what can we learn from that time that we're spending in turmoil, in upset, in not feeling the presence. There's a critical choice that each of us face when we find ourselves in the wilderness. I want to tell you first and foremost, joy has never been taken from us during times of trouble. We may be too blind to see it. We may be so engrossed in our own feelings and our own hurt and our own pain that we can't see that that joy is still there. It's covered, and we've covered it ourselves because we're hurting. 
but it's still there. God will never, ever take away our children. He planted it there. We were created with the joy of the Lord in our heart. And He will never take that away from us. But you know, we can be like those Israelites in the desert sometimes. The Israelites freed from slavery in Egypt, and they were sent on their way to the Promised Land. But they had to endure that wilderness to get there, and they didn't like it any more than we do. We don't like being stuck out in the wilderness. We don't like when things aren't going as planned. We don't like when our lives are interrupted. We don't like to be disrupted. We want everything just a smooth sailing. But you know, the old story says, a good sailor will never be made from a calm sea. You don't learn to sail on a smooth ocean. You learn to sail when you can battle the waves. Those Israelites grumbled and complained as they went through the desert. They complained about food. They complained about water. They, they were tired. They were this. They were that. They complained so much that Moses was ready to throw up his hand and say, I'm tired. I'm done with you. But he did. Wandering those days in the wilderness was all a part of God's plan in order to get them to the promised land where they could truly appreciate what He had done for them. So as we make this journey of life, we can choose to give up or we can refuse to give up and use our faith to bolster our journey. God will always use wilderness times in our lives not to erase our joy, but to strengthen our faith. Hear this if you hear nothing else this morning. Genuine faith does not simply believe in God. Genuine faith believes God. Genuine faith does not just believe in God. Even Satan believes in God. Genuine faith does not just believe in God. Genuine faith believes God. And if you've read any scripture in your life, you know that it is filled with His promises for us. This genuine and joyful faith becomes evident when we can say that we believe God when He tells us, I will never leave you nor will I forsake you. Or when He tells us, that He has good plans for our life, not plans to harm us, not plans to hurt us, but good plans for us. Brother Jeremiah was so... That, that is just some of my, one of my most beautiful and favorite passages. And I love it in the summertime because Amy has that on her leg, and I love seeing that verse. Jeremiah 28, 11. It's wonderful. I have good plans for you, folks. That's a promise from God. That's what sustains us when we're walking in the wilderness. When we're laying in that hospital bed, when we're crying because we've lost someone, when our job isn't just right, or when whatever it is that is pulling us away and threatening our joy, we have to claim those promises. We have to claim the promise of God. In the midst of our personal wilderness, when we can say with all honesty that we believe God's promises and that we cling to those promises, that no matter what is going on in our lives, that God is with us and our joy will move us towards being complete, being whole, when we're willing to listen to that word out of place. <coughs> the word of the Lord, the promise that we got in our scripture today is that when the Messiah comes, your deserts will bloom again. When the Messiah comes, your deserts will bloom again. If you need proof of that promise, just look back at some of the characters we talked about over the season after Pentecost. There was the prodigal son who squandered everything that he had and went and found himself <coughs> sitting in a pigsty eating corn husks, going, why am I here when my dad, my dad's servants have it better than I have it right now? And the woman at the well who comes and meets Jesus at an off time because None of the other women would let her come and fill her water jug when they were there because she had a reputation. And she meets Jesus and everything changes. Zacchaeus climbs that sycamore tree and Jesus comes back and says, 
Get your butt out of that tree. I'm going to your house right now. We're going to go eat dinner. <laughs> Matthew the tax collector. Mary Magdalene, consumed with seven spirits. Had them cast out and she became one of Jesus' greatest supporters. Because her life was changed. Jesus came to earth and found all kinds of people whose lives had become like deserts. And it was Jesus that made those people's lives bloom again and He'll do the same for you and me. If we will open ourselves up, Jesus will make our lives bloom again in spite of what's going on. I want to leave you with this this morning. One of my favorite verses from the New Testament. It comes from Paul's writing in Romans. And Paul writes, and we know that in all things, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who are called according to His purpose. We have to remember that Paul doesn't say that everything is good. He didn't say everything's good. But he does say that God can work for good in anything. It's through this principle of spiritual growth that many times we're brought closer to God and we realize how our joy is increased tenfold. I said it earlier. Happiness is fleeting, but joy is eternal. How can we ever appreciate the desert in bloom if we've never seen it as stark wilderness? How will we ever know how wonderful water is if we've never been thirsty? I encourage each of us when we find ourselves in the desert, in the wilderness, don't stay there. Move through it. Move faithfully towards that blooming desert. And if today you find yourself wandering in the wilderness, no matter what it might be, I just want to offer you a word out of place. And on the third Sunday of Advent, that word is joy. Cling to the promise of joy in our lives and know that God loves us and holds great promise for each and every one of us that He has known, He created in His image. He has called us by name. And He loves us with a love 